Oh, you knew this was coming. <laughs> uh, when I finished this episode, I decided, just, just for curiosity's sake, more than anything else, just to go look at some of the top and bottom Star Trek lists that are out there. You know, there's several sites that have their own lists and, uh, you know, that are usually voted for by fan consensus or, you know, viewer consensus, whatever. And I decided to look at that, and on all but one of them, this episode was in the bottom ten. I, what's funny about that, and I believe I've commented on this before, is my opinions don't always gel, in fact, usually don't gel, with those lists. I mean, with a few exceptions, it's like, yeah, wait, why is that rated so high? Why is that rated so low? You know, because we all have different opinions. That's Star Trek, right? We all like things, we all dislike things. So before I go any further, let me just say, if anybody out there legitimately likes this episode, that's awesome. And I would love to know why. Because the fact that you like it doesn't matter per se, because that's up to you and on you. What I want to know, the external person, I want to know why. What is it about that episode that appeals to you? So, I got a bit of a quote here I want to share with you really quick. This episode was to rattle the audience, that would, something that would show sexuality and push the envelope about Risa. Because once you get past the titillation, is this a lifestyle, lifestyle that people in the 20th century can approve of? And there's other statements of that, that this was supposed to be an episode that was examining the morality and sexuality of the Federation in the modern era. <sighs> Why? I know that sounds so strange to comment on, but I feel like that's the initial failure right there, right at the beginning, is that was your intent going into this, was to examine Star Trek's sexuality in-universe. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> sure. You know what's funny? One of the things I've complained about so many times is that Rise is portrayed as the sex planet rather than the pleasure planet. And that is, that's always been a small bother to me. In this episode, there's actually two, two, small references to activities that do not involve sex that people can do with each other. Um, and that, that was actually really cool. I, legitimately. It's probably one of the only positive moments in the entire episode. In fact, I can name three positive moments. Not scenes, just moments in this episode. And that's one of them. The fact that that existed. The other is, do not hug me. And the third we'll get to later. I'll just tell you right now, it's Lita and Rom. Lita admitting that she, she's interested in Rom was a, neat, was a cute moment. And of course, will lead to some good stuff in the future. Right now, it doesn't mean anything good, because that scene was kind of crap. Even Alexander Siddig didn't like that scene, but I'll get to that. He had, he had just had his child. His, not a visitor had just had his child the night before he recorded that scene. And it shows. And I, I don't mean any offense to him whatsoever. I'm pretty sure I couldn't act under those circumstances, too. <laughs> Orph and Dax have been together for four episodes. And there's no relationship there yet. Now, it's obvious Worf wants a relationship. But so far, this appears to be basically, you know, boyfriend-girlfriend. Now, I'm not laying judgment on that. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with just wanting to be with someone romantically for a while with no long-term intentions. But by all accounts, that is exactly what this is. It is Worf who is bothered by that and who wants to talk about it. Oh yeah, I should clarify something. Since this episode comes across, as, as many typical attempting humor episodes do, as male versus female, I want to make it very clear that I'm actually not on either side on this one. It will sound like I'm on one side or another, but that's only in the individual moment. If you zoom the camera out a little bit, all I see is two idiots who have no idea what they're doing with each other. So, no, I'm not on either side. And, well, we'll get there. So, nothing wrong with that per se, but that sounds like... Hang on. That sounds like the kind of thing that they should sit down and discuss. Now, we know that Dax has been hesitant and indeed resistant to discussing this consistently and repeatedly before they went on vacation and during the vacation itself. Worf, there's a reason Worf constantly is bringing up the we should talk about this. Now, that's an actually fairly reasonable thing to do for him. For her not wanting to deal with it, well, to be understanding, that actually makes sense too. Especially if Dax only is interested in the, the boyfriend, basically. And again, no judgment. But... I still tend to err on the side of communication. 
And in her circumstance, if that really is all she wanted, she should say, listen, I don't want to have a big, deep conversation about a relationship. I like what we have now, and that's all there is to me. If there's going to be something later, then that's great. Let's leave it later. Be honest about it. Now I know what you're saying. Well, hang on, Lore. We know that there's some deeper you know, romantic love between the two. With the advantage of hindsight, yes. But none of that has been presented to date. And that's my point. As of this moment, there's nothing that we, the audience, have seen to indicate that she actually wants him in any more of a fashion than my boyfriend. And again, no judgment. And I keep having to say that because I have a reputation as a prude. Because I am a prude. I, I, I absolutely am, at least in, as far as my own personal affairs. Whatever you want to do is up to you. I don't care, as long as I don't have to be a part of it. But I'm kind of with Worf on that respect. What I mean by that is Worf is a very private person. Worf is someone who doesn't like other people to get involved in his private affairs or things that he considers to be very personal. He's the person who actually was upset in a previous episode that O'Brien, his friend, would come by and visit him in his quarters. That's the kind of person Worf is. Now, it's not like he doesn't value and, and have friendships with other people. Quite the contrary. He is an exceptionally loyal friend. It's just that he is functionally an introvert. And that's fine. Now, I'm actually not an introvert, but I am very private about certain things. Now, if you want to ask me, Hey, Lore, what do you think about carrots? I'm going to look at these carrots. I'm going to be like, I mean, that's just... It's a private affair. I mean, <laughs> My point being <laughs> that it, this episode feels like a bad sitcom. You know, you know what I mean, right? Like a rom-coms, threes companies kind of a thing. There's, there's the whole tee-hee-hee. There's all them just kind of, <laughs> yeah, and check this out. You know, there's just a lot of, I don't know what else to call it. It's the kind of stuff that I used to see on those old sitcoms, because I used to watch that, those shows, you know, back in the 80s and 90s when I had nothing else to, to really watch at the time. And it's just that, that take, that perspective, it's not melodrama, it's just, it's television. And I know what you're thinking, well, of course it is, Lord. No, you don't understand. It is so fake as to basically be deliberately fake. As in, it's no longer trying to be in character at all. Rather, it is being expressed as an out-of-character thing. Make sense? Now, I'm not saying they're looking at the... I'm not getting to the point where they actually look at the camera and be like, oh, look at this person. I don't mean full fourth wall breaking. I mean, to the extent where the actions and events that are happening are so completely ludicrous that they make no sense from the perspective of a rational human being in-universe. That's the sitcom thing. You know what I'm talking about. The wacky stunts, right? And the, and the crazy schemes and all the stupid stuff. I'm not saying it's necessarily bad, but it's a very distinct flavor. And this episode has that everywhere. They keep needling Worf about this. And they keep trying to, to portray this as just kind of a joke. Like, ha, ha, ha. And, of course, the episode is, is completely ended and wrapped up with a bow by... After it's an event that nearly caused untold amounts of damage and hardship to multiple people, hundreds of thousands of people, and it's all wrapped up into a bow by, give me the remote, grab, fling, and that's the end. What? Anyways. So... A couple of thoughts that occurred to me as this episode was meandering on. Worf mentions the line about the uniform. I've actually mentioned this uniform thing before. I don't remember how many times the uniform thing comes up, but this is one of the only times they flat out say on camera, yes, these uniforms are in-universe designed to be super comfortable and super utilitarian. They also mention the level of terraforming tech on display here, that this planet is so unstable that it basically requires a continuous uh, readjustment of everything to prevent the weather system from going out of control and the tectonic plates to stay stale and blah, blah, blah. Makes me wonder why they picked here. Was it cheap real estate? I mean, Rise has been around since the Enterprise era, so... Anyways, that's actually another loophole that, that I don't want to get into right now. Um. <laughs> Honestly... War, there's actually a really interesting scene where Worf... You know, where she gets it, she appears in a bathing suit so straight out of the Sears catalog. And no offense to Terry Farrell, Terry Farrell's an attractive woman, that's not the point. This is titillating in such a 
70s kind of a way. Like, I don't know how else to describe that. It's like, whoa, check out that, babe, is basically the way it's being presented. And then it just completely shifts gear because Worf then gives a surprisingly well-thought-out, personal way of saying you're very pretty. Because that's Worf. That is Worf. To Worf, it wouldn't be enough to say you're very beautiful. It would be true, but it wouldn't be enough. That's not the way he thinks. That's the way he operates, at least when it comes to romantic affairs. So instead, he sits, and you can see him just processing for a second, and then he is like, okay, just recently I was on a mission. I saw this beautiful nebula, but you surpass it, right? You know, I, I, he obviously says it much flowerier and better than I am, but you know, he compliments her in, in a suitable manner, and it works. And she's like, okay, well, let's go. And then... <sighs> then Quark who I remind you recently got married to a Klingon, uh, four episodes ago, actually, uh, gets two Horgons. Have I ever explained why I pronounce it that way? It's kind of an inside joke, the Horgons. And it takes it and is like, hey, ladies, and and then Quark gets every STD on the planet. Um, <clears throat> I know I'm borrowing that joke. I don't care. It's still valid. Then Vanessa Williams shows up. And I didn't realize it at first, but this is when the episode officially started losing me. I've noticed that there's two types of lamentations for me, at least when it comes to Star Trek. There's the lamentation where it's like, oh God, like it just starts off bad and awful and horrible, and it just stays that way. Go to Bonner. And then there's lamentations where it's like, okay. And, and this thought always runs through my head. Maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe I was too harsh, you know? My memories are just as fallible and just as wrong as everyone else's, so maybe by memory I'm wrong. It's one of the reasons I actually really enjoy going back through this show with you guys, is because I get to experience this stuff again. I feel like I just talked about that last week. Oh yeah, by the way, quick note. I was so worried about my, my attitude being bad for this episode that I forced myself to take a day's break. So the episode uh, uh, Trials and Tribulations, I did that yesterday from my perspective. I forced myself to have the gap because I didn't want to go straight from one of my favorite episodes of DS9 to this thing just so I could have more gap there. Anyways. <laughs> but, you know, by memory, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe I'm just overseeing it. And then it just kind of starts to go like it's this, it's a train and it just slowly, bit by bit, gets worse and worse and worse and worse as you're going through it. That's this episode because as soon as Vanessa Williams shows up, it's already bad. They're already doing the weird, you know, the, the sitcom thing, like I already mentioned. They're already being needlessly antagonistic. They're already being excessive in, as far as weird characterization. And then just out of nowhere, Vanessa Williams shows up. And she's a bad actress. I try to be nice and kind and understanding, respectful and polite. This woman has no sense of timing, of tone, or of how to do anything with regards to her presentation. You don't just walk up and say, oh, yes... I remember him. Before I killed him, that is. Death by Jamaharon. There's better ways to go. Everything about the way I just said that, and of course the way she just said that, is wrong. Those lines are already kind of bad, but they could be presented much better than that. I, I don't know if I should put this on her limited experience as an actress, which is very limited, or on, and I hate to say this, Renée Bergenois, who has had experience as a director, but... It's a director's job to pull a performance out of an actor, and he failed in this case. I hate to sound so harsh, but, well, I'm just trying to be blunt. He did not pull a good performance out of her. She is terrible this whole episode. She she never says any line correctly, and she always has just completely the wrong mood for anything going on. Oh, yeah, and at the end, this is I know this is me commenting on this, but she pronounced it Rasa at the end. I rewound twice just to make sure that I wasn't mishearing that. Some people shouldn't be actors. I mean, that's, that's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, okay, so she shows up. We find out... We find out that Curzon died by Jamaharon. Now, I've, I believe I already brought this up in Captain's Holiday, but just tell us what it is. Just tell us what Jamaharon is. We get it. It's sex. Okay? The copulation is a thing for both romantic purposes, entertainment purposes, and reproductive purposes. 
I think we can all be adult enough to address this. And you know what? That that right there is my second biggest problem with this episode. And we're going to cover these as we go. Please forgive me. This is probably going to be a long episode. I do apologize. Because the first thing is the sitcom thing. That bugs me. The second thing is the fact that this this feels like an episode for kids. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, <laughs> there's... There... <clears throat> There are, you know, worse ways to go than death by Jamaharon. I mean, yes, that's a technically true statement, but who says something like that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he, he got to go out, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean when I say for kids, right? I don't, I don't mean kid kids. I mean, like, teenagers, basically. Juveniles, to put it as bluntly as possible. The whole episode just kind of dances around it as if, oh, my God, sex is just the greatest thing, and we totally have it. And at one scene... Chase Masterson is kind of like this in an extremely precisely crafted shot to show off as much of the center of her chest as possible without the censors getting on them about it. Originally, they actually had a much, much more revealing shot, actually, believe it or not. Now, <laughs> I want to address this point, the, the juvenile point, because the creators have addressed the juvenile point, and they have said that the reason why is because of the censorship. Because they wanted to do an episode about the sex, sexuality and morality of the Federation, which, again, is already a flawed concept in my opinion. But whatever, they wanted to do that. But this is Star Trek Deep Space Nine in the late 90s. Um, you can't do that, basically. This is not HBO. This is not 2018, where that kind of thing is more acceptable when it comes to television, or TV, uh, TV can be put onto private networks or in private distribution, where they can get away with that. They simply did not have the ability to show off sex the way they wanted to. Now, I don't think they needed to, because I still think you could have righted a, a, a sexual tale without having sex on camera. It's the same way you can have a gritty and horrible war story without showing people's guts flying all over the place. We just did that in uh, Nor the Battle to the Strong, right? So it's not like you can't do your concept here as long as you carefully craft it. But for whatever reason, everyone seems to focus on the fact that they, they couldn't show the sex and that that was the flaw. Why do you want to show it on camera? Now, I, I know, I know why they want to show it on camera. I understand the nature of ratings and that people are into that, and as I said earlier, I'm a prude, so I'm not. Whatever. But my point is, it's not necessary for your base core point, which is to try and talk about morality and sexuality, to show it on camera like that. And again, I just demonstrated my point with that one, so why is this an issue? So instead it just comes across as, well, I already gave the perfect analogy earlier, the Sears catalog. Quick side note, how many of you have any idea what I'm talking about with the Sears catalog? either generically or specifically. Yeah, I did it too. I'll admit it. I, I mean, that was a while ago, obviously, but it's still true. So, death by Jamaharon. Oh, no. Um, oh, my God. I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. Hang on, I can't even read what that says. What? I, I literally don't know what that says. But uh, anyways, let's get to the next point, because the next point is the next point. So it's like, it's like going down a staircase. It's like falling down a staircase, which I've actually done in real life, so I can tell you exactly how it feels. It feels terrible. I had a bruise the size of a watermelon on my back for weeks. Um, I guess it's technically multiple bruises. No joke. So the new essentialists show up. What? Who thought this was a good idea? When I say I am a prude, and I certainly am, these people are not what I am. I know that these people are what people think of when they think of a prude. Because when people picture a prude, they picture, it is unseemly for you to engage in such canality. You should best yourself. I mean, they basically came across as the space Amish. And not the real Amish. I've met several Amish people. Those people are cool. I mean, like the stereotype of the Amish, right? Why were these introduced into the story at all? And why were these decided to become the villain for this work? Is it just for the threat of the weak? Because that's pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. But I'll get to that more in a moment. So they come along and they want to, they want to return the morality and the, 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 the coral... Hang on, I wrote it down. They want to restore, that's it. They want to restore the moral and cultural center of the Federation. I want you to do me a favor. 
I want you to tell me what the moral and cultural center of the Federation is. Go ahead, I'll wait. Do, 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 do. Oh, I don't want to get copy wronged. I shouldn't hum that. Anybody? I'll go and give you my answer. Oh, uh -huh. I mean, you could say mutual cooperation and respect, but that's about all I got. What exactly about a pleasure planet, which happens to include a large amount of sex, is against the moral, cultural foundation of the Federation? They say that like four or five times in the episode. Worf repeats it even. I agree. We need to go back to the moral centers of the Federation. What does that mean exactly? Now, we know what it means because of the way the episode is slanted. The idea is not that it has anything to do whatsoever with the Federation or decency or, or anything like that. Instead, it's the... The exact what I was just telling you about. It is unseemly. We should go back to the, an era where things were better in my age. Is basically what he comes across as. And I just want to smack him. And he is so pathetic, too. The, okay, so I mentioned Vanessa Williams, not a good actress. The guy who I didn't bother writing his name down, and I'm not going to bother looking it up, who plays Mr. Uh, I'm an Idiot, decides to say... I'm going to go ahead and play this role as dryly as possible. I'm not going to have an ounce of charisma, and I'm not going to know how to use my body my motion in any way, shape, or form whatsoever to add to my presentation. Any questions? I'm sorry, I probably actually put more charisma into my making fun of thing I just did than this man did in this entire episode combined. You know how I often say how Star Trek lives and breathes on its good guest stars? And I stand by that statement. The opposite is also true. You get really bad guest stars, you get a bad episode, and that is a consistent truth in Star Trek. So, uh, uh, there's this scene, uh, it's the titillation scene where Chase Masterson's chest is showing, part of her chest is showing. Now, what's funny about that scene is, as Dax and Worf are walking into the scene, Dax is saying something in the background. I rewound that scene several times to get what she's saying. And what she's saying amused me. She says, people have been predicting the end of the Federation since it was founded. Trust me, I know. Something about that really amused me, because that sounded like something I would say. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, WoW's dying. I don't even like WoW right now, and I still laugh at the idea that WoW's dying. Anyways. <clears throat> so then he gives a speech. And the first thing he does is he says, you people are stupid. He doesn't say it like that, but he might as well have. He has no idea how to speechify, and I don't know if that's on the writers, or if it, we're literally supposed to think that in character this man is just this uh, ineffectual, that he just lacks any capacity to get across his point. He doesn't get up there and, and try to win them to his side or speak of the, the cultural centers of the, of the Federation and how we, we have decent uh, tolerance. I, I, again, I don't even know what his actual point is, so I'm just making stuff up. You know, at, at least he could try to go up there and try to build up his ideals and try to showcase them in a positive light for the people who are listening. And instead what he does is he says, I know, you think I'm a dumbass. Well, you know what I look at when I see you? Children. You're all nothing but children. Insult, insult, insult. Insult, insult, insult. And that's his speech. <laughs> Again, either this is bad writing, because the, the writers didn't know how to, speak, to write him properly, or this is deliberate, which would instead make him a completely irrelevant character. It's kind of like making the villain of your story the random guy who tries to get you to sign up for, like, Kristikov or whatever, I, I know I pronounced that wrong. Uh, in the in the airports, that's not a thing anymore, but it used to be. <sighs> you need to learn to take care of yourselves. You need to learn to be able to stand up for yourselves rather than running to Starfleet. I don't even know where to begin with how stupid that sentence is, so I'm just going to move on, ignoring the fact that he's also saying it knowingly, I might add, to several Starfleet personnel. Then someone says, Oh, he certainly has a flair for a dramatic... No! No, he really doesn't. He likes to... I, it just clicked. It literally just clicked with me just now. It's like trying to argue with someone on the internet who thinks they're smart and isn't. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know what I'm talking about with that, right? Where they're like, oh, yes, well, if you do this, then Hitler. <laughs> you know? Because that's what he does. He literally catapults from... If I look at you as children, what do you think the Borg look at you as? Or the Romulans or the Dominion? What? That's not an argument. That's not even the beginnings of an argument. 
so Worf starts to agree with the fundamentalists. Now, let me just go ahead and say this. Let me just get this out there. Worf is the closest person to acting in character in this episode. Bashir doesn't act in character. Dax doesn't act in character. We don't know enough about Lee to really judge her, so whatever. Quark, eh, he's probably in character, kind of. He's only in three scenes, four scenes. But then we have Worf, who decides to just kind of be like, you can almost see him nodding, like, yes, yes, we need to return. Oh, that's not the Worf voice. We need to return to the, to the greater eras of the Federation, yes, yes. Your vague statement and, and proclamations of doom have indeed swayed me, sir. What? I want to remind you, this man has, is so vacuous, he hasn't actually made a point. The closest thing to a point he's made is, no, no, bad, bad, stop enjoying sex, stop it. That's the closest thing to a point he's made. And you're telling me Worf, who has been nonstop ramming Dax for the last four episodes, to the point where they have been regularly showing up in the med bay for, for fixing it, is someone who believes in that for even one iota of a second. This is after Troy, too, I feel like pointing out. Don't tell me he had plans to marry and be permanently with Troy, either. Anyways, so Worf... Worf is, of course, fairly anti-cheating. Understandable. You know, he, is, he is very pro, uh, pro-monogamy, pro anti-cheating, right? That's his shtick. That's his uh, perspective. I'm with that. I understand that. And, of course, it makes perfect sense why he would be so upset at Bashir and Lita. This leads to another one of those sitcom moments, the kind of things that would only really happen in sitcom, you know, the kind of bad, oh, right, we forgot to tell you, and the multiple times we had interacting, and the six-hour flight here... We forgot to tell you why we were doing this. Of course, we're so silly. We just wanted to make drama happen for no frickin' reason. So then they admit they're doing this, uh, what is it, the, the the ritual of separation or whatever, where the two of them are, are going through this Bajoran thing, which basically involves them having as much sexual interaction with each other and others as they feel like, and then going through an actual ritual and saying goodbye. <sighs> Okay, I'm going to say something that's going to get me, get a target painted on my face, but I don't actually have anything really against the ritual uh, on paper. The idea of being like, hey, hey, Bobette, hey, listen, it's it's lore. We're over, right? I mean, this this has kind of run its course, right? You want to go out, have a have a good night, and then we'll call it cut after that? Cool. You know, there, 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 I, I could get that. I could get behind that as long as it was a mutual thing between both people. I, I'm with that. But the way they present it is just, huh? Like, this is a Bajoran thing? Really? Was this designed before or after the occupation? Because it would make more sense if they did this during the occupation for reasons I don't feel like getting into. And then they actually get to the ritual itself, which is just, okay. <laughs> we drink of this, and then we smash it! And then, we're done, we're cool. We get, look like we're going to kiss, but no, we're not. We're not, sorry. Now, granted, that scene just kind of sucked for a lot of reasons, but I really feel like they were just like, okay, we need a ritual. Quick, quick. Uh, okay, they both drink from the same cup, and then they're done. Okay, cool. Wait, no, no, we need something more. How about they almost kiss? Okay, cool. Like, I get that the Bajorans kind of be tend to ritual-centric. I do absolutely understand that. This just came across as silly to me. But again, on paper, this is one of the least objectionable things in the episode. And, of course, it does lead to Lita admitting that she wants to be with Rom, which is kind of awesome in its own right. But again, we'll cover that more later in episodes that are actually good. Now, i got to be honest with you, and you're going to probably make fun of me. Up until this point in the episode, for the most part, it's just a boring, disinteresting episode. Like, the intro actually aggravated me. Like, the first five... Everything up until the teaser... And it bothered me. And then it was just, all right. Okay. I mean, we got some bad performances by the two guest stars, but otherwise, whatever. Then the episode starts to nosedive in quality. You remember I mentioned the two types of lamentations? So then the new fundamentalists show up. The, excuse me. The new essentialists, sorry. They show up, and they're like, ha-ha! We're going to... to tear down the, the thing, and we're going to attack and knock over the table, and we're going to threaten people with guns. 
Oh, don't worry. There's no, there's no things in the guns. We weren't actually going to hurt anybody. Of course not. Of course not. We would never hurt someone in the name of the cause. So then, you know, they, they, it starts to nosedive into stupid very quickly. I find myself wondering if Ryza has to deal with people like this on a regular basis or not. And I, it reminds me of another question. Where is the security on Ryza? Now, I know that sounds like a strange statement, but let me, let me explain this a little bit for you. Ryza is a resort world. I know they call it a pleasure planet, but I prefer to think of it as a resort world. You know why? Because a resort world is something that is an economic locus point. That means a lot of things go in and out of it. A lot of services with regards to the people. A lot of uh, customers go in and out on a very regular basis. And a lot of materials go in and out in order to keep the place functional and running. Where's the security? Because there should be security. Now, I don't mean like a guard at every standpoint, but this is the kind of place that you should have ships regularly in orbit to defend. You know why? Because it's a resort planet. Even if you ignore the financial side of things, which I just mentioned, think of it from a personal perspective. This is the one place where you're supposed to go and be able to just, just sort of unwind for a moment, right? This is the one spot where you can go and not have to think about how horrible your life is, or all the problems, or, or whatever other conflicts, or whatever duty rosters, or whatever you're going through. You can just relax and enjoy your life. And to be 100% blunt, the only way for that kind of safety to exist is for the security to be to provide for it. Now, you could argue that that security exists up in orbit. That's possible, because they never mention anything about anything in orbit, and the essentialists are down on the planet. And as we already mentioned, guards at every station isn't going to work. But I point that out because if there are, in fact, ships up there, then his argument is vacuous. Now, as I've mentioned before, Mr. Idiot Face, I really don't care about his name, has made a very non-point about... It has done a bad job of making his non-point. You think I'm a bad public speaker? This guy's incredible. So, it's entirely possible that I'm right. That there are ships in orbit. That this is a regularly patrolled, regularly defended system, which is probably one of the most secure systems in the Federation, and he is just ignoring all of that because he wants to make his point about sex being bad. Or whatever the hell his point actually is. I don't even know. So, Worf, uh, then, then the bad scene happens. And this is just melodrama, bad relationship writing 101. Because he and she both just argue at each other and yell at each other, but not in a real or believable way. More in a, oh, I'm just trying to deliberately provoke you kind of a way. That, okay, that sounds bad. Obviously people do that in real life. But my point is there's a certain tint towards Hollywood argument, especially romance arguments. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I, I, why, uh, you, I suppose you have another list of things I'm doing wrong. Is her reaction to him saying that he wants to just sit and talk about their relationship which is just ridiculous in its own right and automatically puts him on the defensive for having to adjust for, explain why it is that he wants them to adjust to this nude conversation rather than just letting it go and, come on, just go to bed. I just want to relax. Well, keep in mind that I am, up until this point, I'm still with Worf on this one more than I am on Dax's side because Worf just wants to hammer out what their relationship is and figure it out, Right. Even the dog wants to know what the relationship is at this point. And so Dax is just stonewalling him at every turn, absolutely refusing to actually discuss this with him. Keep in mind, they had a long trip. And was, keep in mind, they didn't do this back on DS9. Then they had a long trip. Granted, not a lot of privacy. Then they had a whole day of, it, of time to do it. And then they, they're finally at night in private. And he's just sitting in credit to Dorn. He gets across the impression of someone who's just waiting, just like... Like, he has been holding this in for all this time, and he just really wants to talk with her about it. Then, of course, in typical Hollywood fashion, he escalates the argument by immediately going and insulting her, which leads her to insulting him, which leads to both stonewalling the other, and there's the end of the scene. So... Then... <laughs> well... <laughs> then a series of scenes happen that make me almost believe that there was some competency when it came to writing this episode. Because remember, Worf is already a very private person. 
So this kind of a place just rubs him wrong to begin with, okay? So that's the baseline. He's already in a bad mood. Then he has to deal with the Bashir and Lita thing, which irritated him. That was resolved, but it still adds to the pile. Then there's the fact that Dax is consistently stonewalling him. Then there's the fact that Dax is, how do we say, openly interacting with a former lover in a way that is, is let's be honest with ourselves, sensual in its appearance. Now, that being said, based on Terry Farrell's performance, based on Dax's presentation, there's nothing sensual there. Dax isn't trying to flirt with her. She's just hanging out with an old flame. That's it. There's nothing there. But you could see how all of these things piled up could make Worf just kind of start to lose it. So he, him flowing the Horgan, yeah. Then Worf loses me. Because up until this point in the episode, Worf has only bothered me four times. Yeah, I counted. Whereas Dax had bothered me four times. Then, Worf decides to go and become the bad guy for the episode, and decides to shut off the weather control system to really escalate the matter. And his, his reasoning? How are these people going to withstand a Dominion invasion if they can't take a little bad weather? That is... <sighs> wrong. <laughs> I mean, I don't have the words in front of me, or in, in the front of my brain right now, to explain fully and distinctly how wrong that is. But that is a form of a logical fallacy. It's saying... It basically ignores all details, subtext, and nuance in the, f in the favor of making a surface argument, and the surface argument then being applied as an absolute in order to establish the real argument. I mean, all these people are all bothered by a little rain. What's, what are they going to do when things actually go bad? And you can say, oh, he's got a point, if you ignore all of the actual details of the circumstances. How many of you guys have been on vacation? Real vacation. Now... I know that Star Trek isn't quite like real life, so let's remove the financial th from things for a second, okay? Let's assume vacation was free, but you still have to get time. You still have to make the transit. You still have to make plans. You still have to book it well in advance. You still have to be back by a certain date. Even if you remove the money from the equation, going on vacation is a huge hassle. It's something that can only happen under certain circumstances and requires a lot of time and effort to make it work, right? So... I want you to imagine that you have just gone on vacation. You're finally there. Oh, my God. And then it's just a little rain, right? Your vacation is just a little ruined. And now you get to go back having basically not gotten your vacation or the full vacation you wanted. And it's not like, I mean, you could argue that, well, people need to just be able to toughen up a little bit. No, they don't. This is a resort planet. They literally came here to relax. You do not need to toughen up on the planet where you're relaxing. And that's... Uh. So then, there's a few more scenes which just meander forward, emphasizing how miserable everyone is. You know, the food is, isn't as good, and nobody wants to play ball or do anything. Apparently people are too too depressed to even go have sex. Oh my god. And what we have here is just just point after point making the point I just made. Trying to re-emphasize just how dickish of a move that Worf just made. Again, hundreds of thousands. That's not me saying that. The episode says that. Hundreds of thousands of people's vacation was just thrown down the gutter because, let's be honest, he had a tantrum. Because that's the real reason. Dax even calls him on it. And up until this exact moment, I was like, okay, this is probably a lamentation. And that was pretty much my attitude. Boring, poorly constructed, bad acting, bad themes, just general nonsense, you know, and all the little points I've been making. It's a bad episode. I, I, I can barely speak positively about this episode, and that generally qualifies as lamentation. Then the episode pissed me off. Really pissed me off. You know what a Freudian excuse is? It's a TV trope thing. It generally means that, oh, well, yes, I did these things, these bad things, but I had a reason. You know, when I was a child, dramatic story. And that's why I did all these bad things. Now, the Freudian excuse can be properly used as a narrative device, but too often it's used as a form of whitewashing. In other words, oh, no, it's all fully justifiable, everything I did, because of blah, 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 right? Even that can be well done. This is bullcrap. 
So it's it, this is the worst, one of the worst examples of whitewashing I've ever seen. Worf has done a lot of really messed up stuff in this episode on a personal level and on a macroscopic level. And his excuse is his sob story from when he was a kid, which taught him to learn restraint. Restraint. To keep himself contained. Now, I know I'm going to get flack for this, but I'm just going to go ahead and be honest about my opinion. Nothing Worf has done in this episode has anything to do with restraint. Nothing. His mistrust of Dax, his inability to properly connect with her or communicate with her, which is also partially her fault, the fact that he has been bothered by all these situations, the fact that he decided to ruin the vacations of 100,000 people, I'm not letting that go. None of the issues in this episode could be laid at the feet of, I must be restrained. Because, and, and it's, it's funny because the story itself should have come across as a really heart-rending moment. It sounds like a really good character moment. And it isn't. It's just so detached from everything. It's like as if I was watching a Looney Tunes and in the middle of this episode someone stops like, hang, 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 hang. And turns to the camera and says, when I was young I, I watched a, a child and, and the, the parent of the child you know, was dying and said, you're going to have to eat me when I'm dead in order to keep going. And the child's like, no, Mom, I don't want to go. And it's okay, it's okay. And then the mother died, and the child refused to eat her, and then the child died too. And then it goes back to the Looney Tunes. What? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Maybe it's my fault. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get some flack for this in the, in the comment section, but I, I have to be honest with you guys. This is so disconnected from anything. It's a good, it would be a good character moment for War if it was in another episode that had something to do with what was going on and some establishment for him. But instead it's just, this is why I've done all these terrible things. And it's presented as that and nothing else. You could, if you wanted to, argue that it's the core problem that Worf is restrained and can't enjoy himself around Dax or anyone, which is why they've been having relationship problems, which is why they go on a vacation, which is why he wanted to talk about it. You could argue that, but that, that thread is flimsy. And again, it's portrayed, the way the episode is slanted and designed is that it's portrayed as that is his excuse for all his bad behavior. And then, and then after all that crap... We get to the point where he goes and has to confront the villain, Mr. Stupidhead. And Stupidhead's like, yes, we need to take this even farther. We'll start doing earthquakes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Except he's too pathetic to even have a maniacal laugh. He is so pathetic that when he is confronted by the good guys, all Worf does is says, give me that. And he just hands over the device. There's no fight. And then, of course, when he says, don't you run away from me, Worf, and he actually backhands him. <sighs> I fail at words to describe how pathetic he is. He is not an obstacle to be overcome. He's not some kind of mentality that needs to be challenged. He is not an indicative of, of a moral center or a counterculture that's developed within the Federation. He's some idiot loser who has decided to take it upon himself to ruin the happiness of many other people for basically no real purpose. He is less than a bug. So then the episode ends. Thank God. Oh, and Worf goes skinny dipping, so he's finally learned to relax. Thank God he learned his lesson. Oh. I apologize, guys. I'll, I'll be 100% honest with you. Going through this episode was difficult. Like it, it challenged my brain's ability to properly connect thoughts. I'm not actually kidding. It was so dull and devoid of anything that I enjoy in Star Trek. You know what I mean? Great character moments? No. Interesting science fiction concepts? No. Fascinating world building? No. Consequences? No. None of the things I enjoy in Star Trek are in this episode. Well, that's just me. And I'm just a viewer... Wait, I don't want to get sued by sci-fi debris. I hope you have enjoyed my thoughts on this episode. I really want to hear your guys' thoughts. So I hope any of you who've listened this long is going to be hitting that comment section. Let me, let me know what you, what you think. I'm going to go take a nap. I need it after this. I'll see you around, guys. Cool.